considering that uh, we are in close proximity with each other, we are going to keep on our masks for the engagement that we are about to have. This session is titled Cancer and Palliative Care in COVID-19 and Other Challenging Situations in Uganda, Experiences, Observations, Lessons and Recommendations for Future Emergencies. We have very little time to speak about these three important topics, so cancer, palliative care and COVID-19. Um, and our focus is on, on the three of them, uh, considering the global pandemic that we, we face right now. Let's dive right in, and I'm going to start with you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Chobe, considering the many hats that you wear. The pandemic struck the African continent perhaps a little later than, you know, than others, and one might say that we, we should have benefited, or we have benefited from learning from the experiences of those that um, suffered this before us. In this context, where are we as a country? Thank you so much, Josephine, for this question. It is true that the pandemic on the, fan on the African continent came a little late, but was not too late. The time span was actually months, a few months. But understandably, it was just a question of time we knew to get here. And uh, we did as much as we could. And the major aspect being that uh, we had had previous experiences in Ebola where it was a big success. But of course, I want to draw comparisons. Ebola is Ebola, and then COVID is COVID, COVID being uh, an airborne disease. So when it came, and of course, trying to, to look at uh, how the pandemic has been, we, as a country, we tried as much as possible to slow down the transmission, uh, the waves, as we did, and we were actually successful, so to say, and uh, to an extent built infra infrastructure or improved our infrastructure to be able to respond to this. But as we'll learn later that COVID is hugely unpredictable and there was no amount of preparedness before could actually make us be as prepared because all the preparedness models pointed in different directions. Uh, to the extent no one knew that in a COVID everything will narrow down to nothing but oxygen. To the extent that you have a hospital, Mulago Hospital, 900 beds, and having patients on oxygen all the time. So that's where we are, but we had a prolonged wave, initial wave, which ended somewhere in Jan. And then we had a, significant, a drastic drop and maximum containment through March and parts of April till when we had a subsequent wave driven by a variant that came from across the border. So to speak on where we are, we are in a, a much stable position than where we were two, three months ago. Notably, though, it, that it is not at the containment threshold that we had in March. That's why you're still seeing us having uh, several hotspots, transmissions in different areas. We are seeing in, uh, in Teso, parts of northern Uganda, West Nile, southwestern Uganda. So, so to say where we are, we are at that flat level of transmission, but at much higher thresholds than what we had earlier. And that creates problems for us that uh, any spike can actually come fast. I think that for a lot of people, mm -hmm. when we have um, questions coming up about a third wave that's somewhere, mm -hmm. is that coming to us? Also because when we start to see the economy start to be opened up, even in little ways, mm -hmm. there are questions of laxity that start to come up. So when we also ask about where we are, is it time now to, to breathe a little, so to speak, or are we still on high alert? Or is this going to be high alert for the next couple of years to come? I take it that breathing a little doesn't mean to remove masks. <laughs> 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 so uh, I wouldn't say 
as I said, we are we have stable transmission, and that's why we still have free beds. You're not hearing people crying about beds, but certainly, if we don't if we don't maintain the observance of SOPs, then we may shorten this period of time and have another spike. And why am I saying this, that uh, the variant that drove the past wave is still here, and actually the predominant wave. And what we do have now is that we are having more people that are infected and with deeper virus penetration across the country than we were then much as we are having vaccination taking place, which is a little bit slower, but of course in the next few weeks or months, we're going to be picking up very fast on vaccination. So talking about the third wave, yes, it may come, but we have a chance to really avert it by one, taking up vaccination, two, by observing the SOPs. Through are we and through. more ready for the third wave than we were for the second? Yes, we were. One is that uh, we have more experience managing. We have, uh, we have been at this for some time. We are mobilizing, and I think in the next few weeks, we'll have sufficient or additional oxygen than you were then. Then we're looking at expansion of uh, treatment in hard to reach areas. For example, the islands where we didn't then then increasing our bed space uh, in additional uh, around 10 to 15 facilities across the country in addition to what we had and of course improving our emergency emergency services for patient transfer you spoke earlier and, and there's one more question for you before i move to the other panelists you spoke earlier about the sops and uh, what we realized, one of the consequences which is pertinent to this conference was the disruption um, of efforts to diagnose and treat cancer when we saw the COVID-19 um, SOPs that were put in place, the measures that had to be extended, the lockdown and so on. And listening to some of the uh, ladies that were speaking earlier, we saw how that affected them. Um, when restrictions are imposed on public movement, patients cannot go for life-saving medical help. What provisions were made or what provisions are being made even as we speak to ensure that while we battle a pandemic, we do not lose ground on the front against cancer and other illnesses, but we'll focus on cancer at the moment. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, we, we learned lessons from the first wave where we had a complete lockdown, no transport, nothing. Certainly, there was an effect on continuity of services, which lesson we learned that in the subsequent lockdown, uh, the design was in such a way that we would allow movement of people using any means of transport available for them. And uh, it is uh, initially there was some bit of confusion on what needs to be done. But as a subsequent, in the subsequent weeks, in the second lockdown, that actually was eased, as uh, colleagues here who were in care would tell you. And that came as a lesson from the initial lockdown, where we had complete lockdown, and the access to the clearances at the different levels, at the districts, was a little bit, a bit of a very cumbersome, which wasn't the case in the second lockdown. So I, I entirely agree there was, uh, in the initial lockdown, disruption of that, but in the second lockdown, we were able to really see that, and uh, the effect was actually hugely minimal. Well, let's talk about um, the state of cancer diagnosis and medical care in Uganda, and I'll, I'll turn now to Dr. Omodin and Dr. Walusansa. What are the main types of cancer afflicting our population? Perhaps if you could break them down, um, by age group or by gender or any other category that would help us just understand very clearly what we're speaking about and the state of it. Dr. Omoding and Dr. Alsanza. <laughs> they like to say ladies first, but Absolutely. We'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you the platform. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Josephine. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here to talk about cancer. Uh, especially in the era of COVID. And, uh, to answer the question, what are currently 
you know, the commonest cancers that we deal with are the Uganda Cancer Institute and Uganda overall. I'll need to mention that uh, our top, you know, five commonest cancers that we currently deal with, uh, number one is cancer of the uterine cervix. And uh, it's the topmost cancer and the first number one cancer among women uh, in Uganda at the moment. Eh? And we definitely know that this cancer is associated with a, a viral infection, uh, human papillomavirus. Second on the list is cancer of the breast. Again, uh, a cancer that affects women uh, more than men. For every one uh, uh, man who gets breast cancer, you'll have 24 women getting breast cancer. Eh? Uh, third to it is cancer of the prostate, and that is the number one cancer among men. And, uh, it is our third most commonest cancer that we are actually seeing at the Cancer Institute. We've got uh, number four, which is um, uh, the Kaposi sarcoma uh, uh, cancer. Kaposi sarcoma is very much uh, very prevalent because of the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic. And you go down the list to uh, lymphomas as well. But what I need to mention to the audience is uh, of all our top 10 most common cancers, we uh, over you know, six or seven of them are actually infection related. Eh? So a uh, majority of our cancers in our region are infection related. Eh? Um, in, in terms of uh, our current incidence, we are seeing close to uh, 32 to 40,000 new cases per year at the Uganda Cancer Institute. And quite more disturbing is that over 20,000 of them die within the year. And a reason to that is a majority over 80 to 90 percent come with very late stage disease. Late stage, what do I mean? I'm talking about patients who come with stage three or stage four disease, a disease that has spread beyond the origin of the tumor. And most often that is associated with very bad outcomes. Eh? In the current era of you know, COVID, we've definitely had great challenges uh, in terms of caring for cancer patients. Eh? You know, looking at a category of individuals who are at a high risk of COVID and most of just not high risk of infection, but also severe form of COVID infection, uh, actually cancer patients. Eh? And, uh, and, and, and in, during the lockdowns, we have definitely had challenges both in accessing care uh, a patient could not travel from up country to come to the institute for treatment. We had also challenges in terms of screening. Uh, people could no longer access screening clinics during the lockdowns. And in a way, this could have possibly led also to late you know, diagnosis and eventually uh, delay all in treatment and subsequently bad outcomes. Eh? Um, other than that, we have also had, of course, you know, uh, uh, challenges in terms of uh, uh, being able to, you know, um, uh, you know, provide, you know, chemotherapy in a setting where you have both comorbidities, a patient who's having COVID and having cancer, uh, that alone will determine that you must delay uh, treatment initiation until you address the COVID, you know, uh, illness, eh? because it takes a more uh, precedence to care for patients who have COVID and for cancer if both are presenting at the same time. You, you, you mentioned the challenge for patients to make their way to the hospitals um, during the lockdowns. And I guess Dr. Chove, this points to how we need to do better, even though we did better the second time around from the first time. Um, Dr. Alusansa, yes. In addition, I just wanted to add to what Abraham has shared with us, that also children get cancer in this country. And unlike the Western world, where cancers in children are mainly leukemia, we have lymphomas. And as he mentioned, most of our cancers in children here are also associated with infections. And uh, in addition to that, we also get solid tumors like, uh, like, uh, the, the, like, like nephroblastoma, which is a cancer of the kidney, and other solid tumors. But it is important to know that a cancer such as Bucket's lymphoma was first described in this country and it was very prevalent in this country. It's still prevalent, and it's associated with malaria and other in viral infections. So also children get cancer as a special group. Yes. I, I was actually going to ask you, um, when Dr. Muding speaks about infections, and you've mentioned them as well, what infections are we speaking about? So the infections, that most of the infections that are associated with uh, cancer causation are viral infections. 
viruses have the capacity to to input their once they once they have infected the human being they, they have the capacity to adjust and put their viral genome activities that uh, promote cancer development. I think that's how simple I can make it. And many of these viruses are prevalent here. Viruses like the Epstein-Barr virus that is associated with lymphomas and Burkitt's lymphoma. Viruses like the human papilloma virus that is associated with, the, with cancer of the cervix and some cancers of the esophagus. And uh, viruses like uh, hepatitis B that works in a different way that is also prevalent in this country. So by and large, the viruses are small particles that are able to adjoin their, their DNA to the DNA of the human being and switch on cancer causation. So that's how we, we get it. And most of these viral infections are also, are, are also related to poverty and overcrowding, as you know, hepatitis B, EBV, and all the other viruses that are associated with cancer. And HIV, the big one in the, in the room, which just plays around with the immune system and the immune system is a very big is a very plays a big role in prevention of cancer because by and every day there are cells that are becoming errant but the immune system has a housekeeping housekeeping uh, role that it does to remove all the cells that have become errant that are on their way to become cancers so HIV affects the immune system and that activity which would override all the other things that are going on is lost. So that's why patients with HIV, in addition to having, uh, having the other viruses, have that. And the other one that I haven't talked about is the human KS virus, the, AK, the human KS virus that is very prevalent in this country, that uh, some studies have estimated it at about 60% and it spread through saliva and somehow that predisposes even people who don't have HIV to getting Kaposi sarcoma. So many of our infections here, if you look at the top, top five, many of them are associated with, with viral infections that are prevalent and are silent in us. But when something goes wrong, the immune system is unable to clear the errant cells and that's how cancer grows and develops in our people. Thank you very much, Dr. Alisasa. You want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, other than the viruses, there are also some bacterial infections that are actually known to uh, predispose or increase or heighten your risk for developing cancer. And particularly for stomach cancer, there is uh, commonly people go around testing for it. It's called Helicobacter pylori. Colonization of your stomach over time may actually lead you to a development of stomach cancer as well. Eh? Um, other than that, they. they you know why it COVID is a new virus and I think uh, being an oncologist and I think it's something that we're going to look very intently to see if it alone might actually lead to cancer causation down the road eh? but uh, as we have discussed I think uh, over 60 percent of all our cancers are infection related eh? okay. and that definitely offers a very good paradigm for cancer control. If we control the infections, either through vaccinations or through, you know, uh, timely treatment, we could actually be able to avert or reduce the incidence and ultimately the prevalence of cancers in our region. Okay. Um, the medical expertise and the facilities that are needed to deal with cancer seem to only be available, and I'm speaking from a point of ignorance here, so it would be nice to, to get educated. They seem to only be available within the big cities. So we'll have them in Kampala, we'll have perhaps in Bulu, we'll have in, in, in the big cities. Is it likely that there are many more undiagnosed cases in the rural areas? And what is being done to expand the medical services to other parts of the country? Again, this is to Dr. Moding and Dr. Alessandra. Dr. Alison, so you'd like to start? Okay, you'd have to be a bit louder because the mask, you know. Okay. So the Uganda Cancer Institute has the mandate to oversee cancer care, uh, cancer research, and uh, cancer training. So it is true that many of the patients who are from rural areas, if they don't have transport, may not be able to access care. But uh, there are plans that are underway that are ongoing to ensure that there is decentralization of cancer care 
uh, by region and uh, making sure that there is a timely diagnosis and timely treatment. Yes, there's been overcrowding at the Cancer Institute because it was it was in the past it was the only center that was treating cancer in the country and as we are aware cancer care is a specialized service requiring a lot of training requiring a lot of expertise but i must say that we have a center that is really active in barara that sees over 1000 patients per year and uh, through the pandemic this was very active we also as have set up in Arua Regional Referral Hospital, we have a center that is starting with, uh, t with at least diagnosis, and we are hoping that as we are capacitated via human resource, we shall be able to start also services similar to the ones that are in Barara. And as I speak, the Gulu Regional Referral, the G Gulu Cancer Regional Referral Center is under construction, but also there are plans underway to make sure that we start the service even before the building is there. And also there are plans in the eastern side to also have the Mbale Cancer Center. So we, as the UCI, are planning to take the services back to the community and make sure that there is easy accessibility. But all this requires money, all this requires training, all this required facilities, as the infrastructure is not there. And there is, there is need for a lot of development. For example, setting up radiotherapy centers in these centers just a banker and uh, a radiotherapy machine and the radiotherapy team as well as the oncologists there. But uh, as we speak, those are plans that are underway and they are taking place. And in as far as, uh, we also have a community cancer center in Mayuge because Buso the Busoga region has a lot of cancer. So we have a community cancer center there which mainly is doing a lot of screening. And uh, in addition to just screening, there is referral to Ginger Regional Referral Hospital. We are collaborating with the Ginger Referral Hospital in the management of cancer of the cervix because we have camps there and we have a service there. And then that is coordinated straight, straight to, to the Cancer Institute where the need is required. And on top of that, even the Cancer Institute runs mobile screening services before the advent of COVID, we used to actively go to communities on a timetable, on a rota, and go and screen and, and send, be able to send back patients for care. But as you, we are all aware, such services and such activities have been hampered by COVID, but we hope that when we are assured that it can be done in a safe manner, we can do it. But that said and done, we are also now taking on the role of working with partners at, 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 at the different centers. We have a new center in uh, here in Owino, where we are working with the clinic there to see that screening activities take place. So we are rethinking how we do this, that we need to go back and work with the centers, train them, uh, empower them, and then they can send the patients to us as we continue, given the new norm that we are living in. What is the state, um, and Dr. Mojeng, this is for you, what, what is the state of cancer treatment in the country as we speak? Are there any cancers that we can now manage better, um, for example, through preventive screening, lifestyle changes, or even medical interventions? Yeah, thank you, Josephine. Uh, to add on what my senior colleague, Dr. Victoria, uh, stated before I answer that question, you, you know, currently we grapple with very late stage presentation, and as you hinted earlier on, uh, it's definitely a factor of uh, a challenge of accessibility to care. And uh, we currently are possibly seeing close to four or five percent of all the cancers that are in the country. Yeah? You could possibly assume the other 90 plus are actually undiagnosed. Eh? And, and, and partly that is because for a long time, the cancer was purely I mean, uh, Cancer Institute was purely based in Kampala, and everybody who had to come for a cancer diagnosis has to journey to Kampala to have a diagnosis done. As Dr. Victoria has hinted out, I think the Institute has begun to roll out to all the regions. And of course, the intent of that is to take care close to the community so that it becomes more accessible. And ultimately, with that initiative, we are looking forward downstaging late presentation. And then once you downstage late presentation, then you're actually able to enhance or increase your cure rates as well. Uh, that brings me to answering like the question. Yes, absolutely. It it's a colossal sum of money and commitment from government, which government has already, uh, you know, uh, given us, you know, uh, initiatives and some funding to do that. Of course, it's not yet enough, but it's uh, 
good baby steps that we have actually taken to actually improve and roll out cancer care. Um, the question you asked uh, about are there any cancers that are curable? Are there any cancers that we can treat now locally? Yes, uh, speaking from you know the last couple of years we've been working at the Cancer Institute, we have actually seen a number of cancers that are actually curable. And of course, cure is hinged or dependent on stage of presentation. If you presented with early stage disease, you're definitely likely to cure that cancer. If you presented with late stage disease, you're unlikely to cure that cancer. So the stage at which you present is very critical in determining your curability. Secondly, the type of cancer that you present with. Eh? World over, there are cancers that are known to be curable, and there are those that are not curable. For example, um, if you presented with, let's say, looking at stage, for example, uh, breast cancer, for example, number our, not number one, our number two cancer among women, if a lady presented with early stage breast cancer, the chances of curability are over 80%. Stage one or stage two breast cancer is curable, and we are able to treat that now here in Uganda. Similarly, if you presented with a cancer, for example, that affects the, uh, the, the, the lymphoid system, what we call lymphomats, 90% uh, of the time those tumors are curable. And amazingly, even in the, in, in the advanced stage, stage three, stage four lymphomas, you can approximate 60 to 70% of the time to be cured, eh? and those we are able to treat here in Uganda. Bowel cancer is the other cancer that can be curable if you presented early, and definitely it's also on the increase because of our changing lifestyles. We now eat diet that is far different from the diet that we ate 20 or 30 years ago. What my mother ate 20 or 30 years ago is different to what I could have had for lunch today. And, and that alone is one big risk factor for why we are seeing an increase in bowel cancer. But however, if you presented early, and how do you present early? You definitely must adhere to the screening guidelines that we have. Eh? Um, you must at least have you know, a fecal occult blood test in your stool maybe once a year. If you've had a very strong positive family history, please do go for um, a colonoscopy to look through your bowel. So in summary, uh, uh, Josephine, one, uh, uh, we do have curable cancers, but it's hinged on the stage at which you present. I think the hope that you're giving, Dr. Moding, is when you keep saying it can be treated here in Uganda. Because the thing yes. about cancer now is every time you see um, a poster about someone with cancer, they're looking for money to go to India, they're looking for money to go somewhere, uh, and that's quite a strain. So to hear that some of these are you can treat here, that's a lot of hope. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think gone is the time when many of our patients actually thought going out was the only hope. Eh? We've built infrastructure in country. We've trained people in country, both out and in country as well. And I think we've, uh, Dr. Victoria will add on, we do have a team that is actually able to handle cancer in country in Uganda. And, 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 and definitely outside referral, it's only subject to if we are not able to really handle those cancers in country. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think that is, that, is, that is something we should be proud of as a country and as a people, that we are able to contain this. During the lockdown time, a majority of Ugandans were not able to travel. And I think all of them were cared by the Uganda Cancer Institute. Yeah? Yes, you wanted to know the status of cancer care and treatment in the country. Cancer treatment is multimodality. It's a multi, it's not one form of treatment does not treat cancer. We need a big team and that team is being assembled. In addition to that team, you need equipment and you need all the inputs. So in as far as chemotherapy is concerned, which is the medical oncologist's duty, we have a lot of drugs. We are privileged to now have drugs that we didn't have 10 years ago. We, even during the lockdown, had at least 80% of our molecules present. And the only catch was that because of the, of, of the lockdowns, some of our suppliers could not bring drugs in. But once the lockdown was released, most of the drugs came in. So we have drugs, and in this region we have the best drugs. We have drugs that are coming from very reputable pharmacies, like Novartis, like Roche, 
and we are dealing at a very good level where they are giving us drugs at a very very competitive price so we have drugs at the institute we have radiotherapy services we have three equipment we have the LINAC the LINAC that we have today at Cancer Institute is the best in the region we even find it funny that a patient will travel to Nairobi to have radiotherapy with a machine that is inferior to ours we have trained staff we have one of the best staff coming back from South Africa. They wanted to be retained there, but they had to come back because they had gone there for four years. So as far as radiotherapy services are concerned, we are building. We are building. But sometimes I think then my question is, uh, how, where are the gaps in communicating <clears throat> this information that we have the resources, that we are able to actually uh, treat people? Because it looks like the first option is, you know, leave the country go somewhere where you know you'll get a machine that's working, go somewhere where you know you'll get drugs. I was interviewing somebody um, over the weekend and they told me they were getting their drugs from the Uganda Cancer Institute. The drugs are expensive. I think he was saying two point something million per, you know. And he said it was at the Cancer Institute and I, I said it's there. He said, yeah, it's there. There are just some times when it's not there and I have to buy it from elsewhere, but sometimes it's there. Where are the gaps in communicating this to the public? I think we as Cancer Institute will have to improve in our public advertisement of what we do. But it's good that you also heard it from the patient themselves, not from us, that the drugs are there. Because government is even buying molecules as expensive as 2.5, as 3.5. And every time we talk to the budgeting committee, we let them know that we need more. Even other drugs that are as expensive and we are not here, or are not even in the region, are there for prostate cancer, for lymphomas, our lymphoma, for example, our lymphomas, which we actually insisted because wherever you are, you should be able to treat a lymphoma and a patient gets better if you have all the molecules. So all the molecules are available, including rituximab that used to cost six million. We get it at a subsidized fee and patients get it for free. So I think it is the numbers and maybe the previous negative image needs to be washed and needs to be rechanged that people understand that Things are not the way they were. Things have gradually improved and we are in a better place and we shall continue being in a better place as long as we continue the way we are. Thank you very much, Dr. Alsasa and Dr. Moding. I'm going to allow you to have a bit of water to drink while I now turn to um, Dr. Birunji and Ms. Juanuka for the next set of questions. So we started with Dr. Chiove to set the stage and then we went to look at cancer most people know about COVID-19 now because of the awareness that's been done. A lot of people know about cancer because there's a lot of noise about cancer. You, somebody in your family probably has, has been through that. But not a lot of people understand what palliative care is. Can you very briefly outline it for us? Okay, thank you very much. Josefina will go first and probably Dr. Doreen will go next. Uh, palliative care is a service that is given to patients with life-limiting illnesses, life-threatening illnesses. COVID-19 has also uh, called in for palliative care. Palliative care aims at improving the patient's symptoms and making this patient feel comfortable, but also making this be patient be independent. And uh, also it looks at the patient as a whole and also looks at the family as well. So it does not just focus on the patient, but it focuses on the patient and the family. And uh, when I say it looks at a, at a patient as a whole, I mean they address the physical issues. Palliative care addresses physical issues, that is the illness, psychological issues, the mind, social issues, the people around him, who, what do they think, what do they feel, how do they feel, social issues, so that this patient is made comfortable together with the family members. And uh, when a disease definitely strikes, the entire family gets sick. So everybody needs to be involved in the care. They need to know what is happening. So that is what palliative care is all about. Okay. Um, let's talk about availability and affordability. And let's talk to Birinji, you want to uh, add a bit on what palliative care is? Maybe just to add that um, in the past, palliative care seemed to be something that is reserved for the dying, and um, that is not entirely true. Um, 
it has a very positive impact yes. on patients who are yes they have a life limiting illness but they are not dying at that time and we have seen at hospice africa uganda we've seen patients who've lived on for years even after their life limiting illness has been diagnosed so it has a very positive effect on the patient and the family we've actually seen patients who have come back into gainful employment after suffering you know this illness and and being sick for a long time it's also important at the time of dying i must add because very many people do not know how to deal with that moment and um with palliative care providers have been you know in a very difficult place sometimes because you're looked at like you're coming to prepare us for death but then some people actually want that preparation so it's a it's an interesting kind of specialty but it's a very um, impactful service and and many patients that have actually experienced it they really testify that they have been supported yeah in the situation that we are in um, already a lot of patients struggle with being able to afford uh, medical treatment and now when you bring in the aspect of palliative care it, it feels like it's an option for the moneyed class only people who have extra money to spare to send their person you know um, to now a specialized place to take care of them like you said in their last days I, is that what it is um, I think in some countries abroad hospice care is very expensive and it's um, something that not many access. But here in Uganda, the services, we, we make an effort to make it as affordable as it can possibly be. Actually, I can I say free to the patients, most of the service providers in the area of palliative care, the hospices and the health facilities, both government and private not-for-profit, they actually are providing this service at almost no cost to the patient so what we what the tends to happen is because it's difficult to run a completely free service we kind of ask patients to make a contribution where they can and many of them do it really out of appreciation but it's mostly affordable to the patients what makes palliative care expensive really is looking at the whole um, patient together when you look at devices, things like colostomy bags and um, other equipment that patients may need, catheters and things like that for their comfort, for their better quality of life, then it seems uh, very expensive. We've, we've really had very um, touching testimonies when it comes to affording such things. But um, in many of the, the hospices, there's a, an opportunity for to get some of these things at no cost because they may come in as donations and um, we are the palliative care association of uganda is really working hard to get the policy in and to get government to, to have a budget for palliative care medicines and devices in order to make it even better for the patients i would probably like also to add that Palliative care is one of the essential services that Ministry of Health offers to its people. Therefore, when you get to uh, government health facilities that are credited to provide this service, because it's not each and every hospital that will provide the service, there has to be a trained palliative care officer to provide that, that service. It is free of charge. It is a service like any other service. And uh, they, w they try to make sure that these things are available, as you know, some of the things may not be available, then they can get them outside the hospital. But otherwise, the services are available in our health facilities, as long as they are accredited. And the healthcare workers are there to provide these services. We have about... The rest of so the, the rural parts of the country, and, and we're not just focusing on... on Again, like well, I was mentioning earlier, for even cancer treatments, um, the, the districts, the cities, but just going down to the grassroots to, to make sure that this is available 
Palliative care services. We haven't reached each and every district. I think palliative care is in over 97 districts of Uganda, about 223 health care sub, uh, services or health centers are providing palliative care services. We have about 23 districts that do not have palliative care services as yet. But the Palliative Care Association of Uganda, together with the Ministry of Health and Partners, are working hand in hand to ensure that all the districts get palliative care services. Because as you realize, it is a service that is required and it is a service that we need. And you never know when time will hit and you need palliative care services. Was Therefore, it affected during the pandemic? Pardon? Yes. Was it affected during the pandemic, this service? And, yes. and how was it affected? I see you both nodding. Um, I'll speak specifically for hospice where I work. Um, and the three sites, we have a site in Hoima, Little Hospice Hoima, and a site in Barara, Mobile Hospice Barara, and then here in Kampala. So the first lockdown was very difficult. There was totally no transportation at, like allowed. And it was very, very difficult. We told patients, follow the procedures the government has put in place, but it was very hard for them. And you know, when, when you're very sick, and the usual thing is to find you at home, and then we struggled initially to even get the permits to get us to go to their homes. So these kinds of patients, getting them onto available transport to come was very hard. So we did a lot of telephone consultation, but it's very difficult to talk to a patient that you wish you could look at and touch. The second lockdown was a bit better because we managed to get permits in time and were able to continue to do some home visits. Um, but then the outreaches have completely been uh, difficult to implement. We have about seven outreaches in total that we run across the country, but it's been very hard to implement those outreaches. Again, like uh, Dr. Victoria was saying, we need to figure out a way to do it safely and, and have enough uh, like PPE to do this kind of work. But um, it, 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 the patient's transport is still a very big challenge. Some of the transport costs are still very high for most of the patients. They come to us and they can't go back. So we have to look for some money to give them to go back. It's really a challenge. Yeah. Mm. Um, for for the, the, the viewers that are um, watching us online, if you have any questions for the panelists, please send them on um, online and we'll be able to look at some of them. I've seen a couple that have already come in. Um, Dr. Chua, I'm, I'm going to come back to you. National response to COVID-19, um, the challenges, the lessons, and the future perspectives with focus on access to essential health services such as cancer and palliative care. I noticed when uh, Dr. Brinji was speaking, she was looking at you um, out of the corner of her eye, a, a bit shyly, but to, to, to speak to the fact that access to these services was still hard, even with the second lockdown. What lessons are we learning and what are we looking to, to the future to do better? Yeah. <coughs> I, I do appreciate that, uh, again, as I said at the beginning, that um, this first lockdown, uh, uh, things were really tight for continental care, uh, not only for cancer, but also for other, other illnesses. Uh, luckily, we didn't see a major change in numbers, most especially mortality. But it's not an, anything to celebrate about. The uh, second day lockdown, certainly as I said, uh, we, we looked at all this and thought and knew that we have to have patients move and to be able to refill their treatment, to, to, to get to care for diagnosis, and then of course referral. And that's why we we had mechanisms where we had that uh, a patient can use any means of transport to get to care. But it's a big lesson that we've learned that uh, in the subsequent, if there be anything like this, and of course we need to understand that uh, COVID is a new thing and we had to learn as we move and we had to adjust as we move 
and uh, the thing next is to make sure that uh, colleagues who are working uh, in uh, chronic care settings need to be brought on board when you're planning some of the aggressive interventions and I think that's a big lesson we've learned to understand the dynamics that existed. But the problem happens here that uh, most of the things come quite fast and we have to take quick quick decisions and uh, we, we, we go back and then uh, work with the, with, the, with the colleagues. But that's a big lesson we've learned and then we will have to, 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 to have. But the other thing that we, th we see is that uh, we've never had a prolonged outbreak, at least in much of our time. I don't want to, ref to, to, to compare this to with HIV, which has been around for 40 years. But we've never had a pronged outbreak and coming in waves, sometimes very aggressive waves. And some of these things, as they come, may not be predictable. For example, uh, we, we knew the second wave would come, but we didn't know when it would come. And uh, that's an area. And of course, understandable. Mm -hmm. Of course, and the magnitude, and uh, and the magnitude, because we had had the previous one. And you recall, uh, people used to praise that for us Africans, uh, we are immune to COVID and all that. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that fell wayside in the second wave. So uh, that's one. But of course, we need to to to. We've learned that uh, most of the things we do, we need to work and adjust as we move and make sure that uh, we have scalable interventions in either direction and also be able to pay particular attention to specific categories. And uh, for example, as you do see in the vaccination, the people, the 500,000 people with comorbidities, certainly we do have uh, a challenge on the actual census of that category and that uh, 500 was modeled. So uh, there's a lot that we need to know how to keep data, how to gather information from the different uh, chronic care settings. So, yes. Oh, all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Chore. Um, two questions. One is going to go to uh, Dr. Moding and Dr. Alusansa. And then the other question I'll send to, uh, I'll send after. So the first question is, is there any collaboration? This question is from Ben on Fred Trinamasco. Is there any collaboration between Cancer Institute and UNBS to identify the cancer causing products to mitigate the cancer prevalence in Uganda in the spirit of prevention is better than cure? Okay. Yes, Dr. Um, there is a collaboration, and uh, when we were setting up Mayuge, that is our community cancer research center. We actually collaborated with UBOS to identify and map out the kind of people and the population. Because the only other population-based registry that we have is the Kampala Cancer Registry, which only looks at Chadondo. And uh, we realized that many of the cancers are not coming from here. And uh, unlike the other researches that are led by collaborators from out, this cancer registry, this community cancer research center is aimed at looking at a a community that is living and looking at the incident cancers and going back to find out what is causing them. We have such a center in, in Mayuge district and it's covering a population and the districts surrounding it. We are hoping that in the future, having learned some lessons from this, we shall set up such community research centers in the north, in the east, and in the west. But we have one like that and it is, it is with collaboration with the Uganda Bureau of Statistics and uh, it played a very big role in delineating and demarcating and looking at the population because with time we shall be able to to publish this data but yes there is there is room and there needs to be real concerted effort to to look at the different emergent cancers that are coming in the country that cannot be explained or maybe could be explained by the different practices that are prevalent in the different regions those are the kind of researches that we, we plan to undertake or are beginning to undertake. Thank you very much, Dr. Alisa. You, you've spoken about the Uganda Bureau of Statistics, and, and that's very key information for us to have. Um, 
Fred's question also speaks to um, UNBS. So we're looking at standards as, as well. Do you want to speak to that, Dr. Modin? Yeah, um, in terms of standards of um, cancer care, or the, the other question in is... In terms of standards of cancer-causing products that might be on the market. I, I'll possibly beg to defer that back to Victoria, but uh, I, I, as far as uh, uh, I know, I think as Victoria has pointed out, our engagement <coughs> with the uh, Uganda National Bureau of uh, Statistics and, uh, is very much in mapping out the population so and trying to get us, yes. The Bureau of Statistics, yes. not with the standards? No. I think in, in, in terms of clinical care, I think it's possibly a very different entity okay. that I, we engage in. Causative agents and a causative things that we will have identified, then we can go back. But we cannot go to UNBS and tell them this is causing this, this is causing <coughs> this, if we do not have the data. So it is the data that is going to inform us. And then we can go back to the root cause and say, this is what is causing this, and I think you need to regulate this. Definitely, yes, we know certain things that are happening, like taking cigarettes, but is it to do with quality of cigarettes? Taking cigarettes and taking alcohol, we know that those activities are taking I place. I think also speak to creams, because usually that's what people speak about the most. Let us see what the data tells us that most of the people coming in with the uh, skin cancer in this area that we are studying are taking up clear creams and then we can go back. But I think without data that is plausible, it's very hard to go and, uh, and say, check this. Because I think they are doing their duty as per the guidelines that are set aside for different countries as far as the quantities of quinolones and whatever that we think is cancer, carcinogenic. But as I speak, I think we are going on the ground to get the figures and study these cancers more, more close up, and then we can share the data and look at the different agencies. It may not only be UNBS, it may be also other, other agencies, including the, pes the, the, the ones controlling pesticides, the ones controlling the salts that we take, and even the different ways in which we prepare our feeds and food. Um, if we have any question from this side of, of the audience, please uh, just let me know. But I will pose the next question that's coming to Dr. Birunji and Ms. Chiwanuka. The question is on palliative care, and it's from Barra Regional Referral Hospital. This conference, so this is the question, this conference has demonstrated that the biggest population of our cancer and HIV patients need palliative care because they present in late stage of disease and most have socioeconomic challenges that prevent access to sophisticated care. How can we advocate for substantive support for the people teaching palliative care in our institutions of higher learning, like universities? They need to prioritize recruitment of permanent lecturers of this essential skill as a strategic way to ensure sustainability of palliative care. The challenge we have as trained palliative care providers is that we are not recognized as such we have to do our usual duties and palliative care is done as an extra mile. This is the reality and this stifles provision of care. Uh, I, I, I can see that uh, Ms. Wanka is vigorously nodding. Th there, there must be a story there. Do you want to take this question? Um, I will take it and she will contribute. Yes, I think uh, the person who has said it, it's a reality because that is what is happening across the country. But this morning, I think we had uh, uh, our director of clinical services uh, 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 give her re his remarks. The palliative care is getting to get recognized because uh, now the Ministry of Health has uh, uh, established a, a, a palliative care, should I call it a directorate? Uh, because they, 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 they are hoping to get an assistant commissioner for palliative care, but for sure the palliative care trained personnel throughout the country are doing the, currently are doing the work as a by the way, as an added thing. If you have interest, you will do the work. If you don't have the interest, then the, the, the patients will suffer because they are not properly put in the structure. So that causes uh, a big challenge, but there is a lot of advocacy going on to make sure that 
those palliative care officers are recognized and also the, 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 the effort to ensure that uh, the, the, the policy is, is signed off. I think that will help a lot. The Ministry of Health is working very hard to ensure that uh, the palliative care officers are recognized because they have even established positions of uh, uh, consultant palliative care personnel, uh, 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 special grade uh, palliative care medical officer, and uh, other positions. So let us be hopeful that things are going to get better. And with the policy which we think will be signed off this yeah, I think things will get better. Okay. Uh, Dr. Birunji, you want to add to that? Yes, um. uh, it's really about us being hopeful because once we have that palliative care policy, it becomes much um, easier to do the advocacy we are talking about. But we also saw a notice that came in from the Ministry of Health requesting the regional referral hospitals to set up palliative care units within the hospitals. So we are expectant that those positions will actually be filled. Mm -hmm. In terms of training palliative care, yes, there is a big gap in the country. And we are hoping that the policy will help because there is an institute of training palliative care at hospice, but also there is another training, the other two training centers in Mulago, the School of Nursing, and in Mild May. But we need to see this training happening at the medical schools. And there is some partnership happening for Makere University Medical School, but then we need to know what's happening with the other medical schools in the country. So we are very, very hopeful that the policy will really help us to look into those details and fine-tune the palliative care uh, provision. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Um, we have another question that's come through. Um, and, and this question, I think, then is for Dr. Moding and Dr. Sansa. What is the mandate of the Uganda Cancer Institute? Okay. Yeah. The mandate of the Uganda Cancer Institute is uh, the name of the institute in many uh, people's mind comes up as a training center. Uh, but, you know, when the Cancer Institute began, it was purely mandated for to provide care for patients who are diagnosed with cancer. But over the years, that mandate has actually evolved to a truly a mandate that befits the institute eh? and that uh, includes right now we do right from cancer education and awareness creation about cancer uh, through our comprehensive uh, uh, cancer uh, control program uh, that you know travels back and forth around the country really to talk about cancer and also to do screening uh, off-site uh, second uh, mandate is definitely diagnosis as well. Uh, we have built infrastructure within the Cancer Institute, uh, both in terms of hematology and pathology and imaging, to be able to diagnose and uh, know the extent of cancer if you're diagnosed with. The other mandate is uh, to do with um, a treatment. You cannot diagnose and not treat, otherwise you wouldn't be uh, uh, relevant. So we actually do provide cancer treatment as well as our mandate. Okay. Uh, the third mandate, uh, I mean the fourth mandate is training. Uh, so uh, the Institute has taken on uh, a training as one of its really very strong arms and in the recent past we have had you know uh, both training for nurses and training for doctors and uh, to that I I'm very proud to talk about the Institute because we've set up fellowship programs. Uh, uh, these fellowship programs are definitely uh, 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 with a singular purpose to train locally uh, uh, clinicians with, uh, sp with super specialization in cancer care. Something in the past that myself and Dr. Victoria traveled out for training, but now we're able to train locally and the institute has evolved to become the East African Center of Excellence uh, in Oncology. And its mandate purely for that is to train skilled labor uh, or manpower for <coughs> cancer care, right from you know, uh, uh, the pediatric oncology, those are doctors who treat 
children in cancer, to adult hematology oncology fellowship programs for uh, uh, physicians who treat adults with cancers and gyno oncological cancer fellowship programs. And we're moving on to even provide surgical oncology and radiation oncology training in country. That is the other uh, mandate of the Cancer Institute. Of course, the other one is research. And, 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 and the Institute is very much involved in lots of research programs, both uh, internally and in collaboration with other institutions, locally and internationally. Uh, the other mandate Dr. Victoria will possibly add on is definitely in uh, drafting the National Cancer Control Program for the entire country. Yeah? And, and we, we can speak a lot about the mandate. And of course, also now, uh, development of you know, um, cancer centers all over the country. As Dr. Dr. Victoria alluded earlier on, uh, it's been the mandate of the Cancer Institute uh, really to roll out uh, uh, cancer services countrywide. Right. Yes. Dr. Alcesa, in perhaps in adding on to, to what Dr. Modinga has said, I've had really great things said about um, um, the children's uh, section. I, I don't know if you want to give us a bit of information about um, what good things are happening there, what uh, changes have been made, and any improvements still also in the Cancer Institute. Okay. Thank you. For the children, we initially had one ward looking after everyone. But over the years, we were able to separate children as not young adults, but children who need specialized care and children facing uh, a life-threatening illness. And uh, we have pediatrics. We have a pediatric unit running both an inpatient and an outpatient service. We have trained and continue to train pediatric oncologists. And uh, we have a service that has, among other things, has a play area, has an outpatient that is kitted to, to just cater for children. Children have a separate infusion area, so they do not sit with adults. Children have their special clinic. They do not attend, are not attended to with adults because sometimes some of the things they may see may actually frighten them. We have child counselors. We have child-friendly nurses. And we have people who have just specialized in looking after children. And I'm proud to say that this year, next year, we shall be hosting, as the Cancer Institute, we shall be hosting the, the SIOP meeting. Uh, our head pediatrics is the incoming and incumbent president of the SIOP. And uh, we also are engaged in, in cancer research in as far as children are concerned. There is a new, there is the activities to see that we improve the nutrition of children. And we ha have collaborated with people who actually provide special meals for children who are sick. At least children are, are assured that they will get a balanced diet because we know that most of our children are coming from very poor homes. But at least there is a balance. The children are, are, are assured of getting a cup of milk every day. So the way we feed our, our adult patients is not the way we feed our children. Sometimes with support from, from our collaborators, they get extra. And uh, even when they are in for the outpatients, and from time to time before COVID, we used to have days when they would meet and get encouraged by other survivors. It's been quite hard. We have special days where we celebrate children who have finished their chemotherapy and they get to get the badges and make the walk. And definitely we celebrate with them when they have gone through the fire. So yes, the child's cancer service is unique because we are dealing with unique people special people and the key to our emphasizing that is that childhood cancers are curable because they are taken care of and many times they can be treated to cure and that is what we are aiming to do and they need a lot of support because you deal with a family many times the people making the decisions for the care are actually not the patients themselves it's their families and they need support to make the right decisions for our special patients. So I think in a nutshell, that's what I can say, but there's a lot of activity and a lot of excitement and there's a lot of room for growth in the child cancer section. And we have a lot of enthusiastic team members there. We recently also acquired a pediatric surgeon because cancers, cancers as I said, are managed by a team. It is not only medicine, you need the operations on time, somebody prioritizing cancer, not thinking about other things. So at UCI we have a pediatric surgeon. We are also hoping to improve the HR in that area that is just specific to children, uh, not just looking at them as small adults and therefore just reducing their doses. There are many other things that 
take place in taking care of a child with cancer beyond just treatment. The support, we have many collaborators, for example, who come in even from the different 3C. What I didn't share is that we have 3C clubs that we in the room and in a, in a bid to, to increase awareness, we took on cancer clubs and children. Most of the schools around the country have 3C clubs. These are children caring for cancer and they talk about cancer, but these clubs actually come in and support the children. Okay. One of the things we would like to see would see also to see that our children who are on treatment do not get their, their education interrupted. So there is what we call school health, I mean school, school therapy, so that we have somebody who can actually walk through the children and tutor them through even during the time that they are here. One of the best P7 candidates actually was a child from, who was receiving care at UCI. And so we do also that support because the child should have hope, not think that everything has come to the end because they have a cancer diagnosis. It's very encouraging to listen to, to what's happening at the Cancer Institute. It's, it's very far removed from the stories that we see a lot of the time. Uh, and um, I mean, when you hear about cancer, you think death sentence. You don't um, see all of the things that are happening at the Institute. Another question here for... Um, on palliative care from John Mwai, Rays of Hope Hospice Ginger. How are the governments, especially in Africa, helping in promoting palliative care because it has become another part of normal that we need to handle so that we can improve the quality of life of the people? So I guess the question is, where has the government come in to support palliative care? Um, I would say that uh, especially for Uganda, We've really worked with our, uh, with our government very well because uh, most of the things some other countries have not managed to move because they do not have the support of the government. But for us, right from the time palliative care was introduced, the government was there. I remember by that time there was uh, uh, the minister, James Makumbi. He accepted that morphine get imported into the country so that patients can receive that uh, that medication in the right form. And if it wasn't for that, then palliative care wouldn't have progressed. But also our government has supported some, some of its healthcare workers to undertake palliative care training. There is also a program of the PPP, public, how do you call it? Public, public private partnership. That is making sure that the medication of choice for pain control, that is morphine, is brought in and the government has a very big role in that and that medication is given out free of charge. So all that is support. But also when you hear what is happening, establishing uh, a, a position at the Ministry of Health at a level of an assistant commissioner. I think that is very, very important. Instructing all regional referral hospitals to establish a palliative care, uh, palliative care units and putting positions there of uh, consultants, uh, all those positions. I think that is very important. And that has helped Uganda to move really uh, a, a notch higher. Because if you look at other African countries, that has not happened. And if we didn't have the political will, if we didn't have the, po the government support, I don't think we'd be where we are right now. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to come back to um, Dr. Omodink, and I will also come back to Dr. Alusansa on the question of UNBS um, involvement. And again, Fred is saying it is on a mandate of research by the Institute that I premised my question on how the Cancer Institute collaborates with UNBS to inform the need of which products should be critically checked for standards from patients' demographic information. But even in, in, in responding to that, um, there's another question from Rosemary Kamfua who says, to Dr. Victoria, thanks for the presentation. It is possible to engage, is it possible to engage UNBS earlier based on some common facts such as aflatoxins and preservatives in foodstuffs being carcinogenic such that the Ministry of Health and UNBS tackle some of the possible cancer causations preventively as research is progressing? Thank you very much for that question, Fred, once again. Uh, Dr. Victoria will add on. Uh, my understanding is the Cancer Institute, as earlier alluded, 
does research and, and that research eventually informs policy. The Cancer Institute is engaged in uh, drafting the National Cancer Control Program, of which actually now rings into my mind that uh, the Uganda National Bureau of Standards is definitely a part and a parcel of that uh, cancer control policy. Okay. They definitely must be on board. All right. Um, someone has come to save the day and, and take the question, so <laughs> let's, let's hear uh, from you, Doctor. I have not really come to save the day, but I've just come to add my voice to this discussion because I um, want to just make this fact that cancer is a multifactorial disease. There's no single cause. And that's important for you know, everyone who is following the discussion, whether on Zoom or you know, here, it's important to know that there's no single bullet that can prevent cancer. And when you look at the products that we receive in this country, in terms of you know, whether the food is imported, the preservatives, my senior oncologist here may not get evidence to pin one and say this is responsible for majority of our cancers. Eh? That's why Dr. Victoria and Dr. Omodin came to emphasizing that 60% of our cancers are associated with infections. But even if somebody has human papillomavirus infection, which is, I think, one of the strongest viral you know, risk factors for cancer, it's not 100% that they must develop the cancer of the cervix. There are other factors that come into play. And this is important, very, very critical for all of us to appreciate that if you want to reduce your risk for cancer, there are many things you have to do. You have to, ha to be vaccinated. You have to practi practice sexual, responsible sexual choices. I, I pause there so that somebody can think what I mean. You know, the number of sexual partners, the practice. You have to choose the diet you eat. Abraham's talked about, you know, the diet being responsible for many of the cancers increasing. He actually said the food his mother ate 20 years ago is different from what he ate at lunch. So even as we choose what to have on our plate, on our menu at home, we must be responsible, deliberate, and objective. Eh? So, so just to relate that to this question again, while you're there, before you leave, is it possible to engage UNBS? And it's very, very possible and very important and necessary. But I, I, why I'm emphasizing this is that our viewers should not think NBS can protect us alone. Eh? We need but to it's possible to engage NBS. In NBS. And I think in the National Cancer Control Plan we are drafting, we are including the role of NBS so that right from the policy level it's clear what NBS can do to support I, I cancer control. I think you need control. to keep saying UNBS. It, it might be, there might be a bit of confusion as to what you speak, which organization you're speaking about. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> UNBS, Uganda National Bureau of Standards. Yes. Let me put it in full. Okay. So thank you very much. But I also want to emphasize eh, that when cancer has just begun, there are no symptoms. So that's one of the reasons why people present late. Somebody will have a swelling in the breast and it's cancer, and they will have it for three years, and they think it will go. By the time they feel pain, they come and say the cancer is advanced. Mm -hmm. And that underlines the reason for frequent checkup. I'm using the word checkup because some cancers cannot be screened for. But mm -hmm. frequent checkup. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, let, let's quickly take the next question um, from German Natwera, who says, thanks to the Ministry of Health and Government of Uganda on efforts geared towards improving cancer care and palliative care access in Uganda. However, a significant number of cancer patients are still unable to access or continue with cancer care due to cost, financial limitations, say for buying cancer treatments such as chemotherapy, ETC. There's also still inadequate human resource, oncologists, palliative care specialists to offer care to the ever-increasing number of cancer patients. What does Dr. Omoding and Dr. Walusansa say about this? <laughs> I'll go first. Yes, Dr. Alcesa. Uh, yes, it is true that we have few specialists in the country. And I spoke about this, that we are trying to, to 
decentralized care because the cost of coming for care at the UCI are not just transport and are not just related to the drugs because the drugs are free. The drugs are free for the basic, the basic drugs are there. It is this, the highly specialized drugs that may become out of, of clinical trials, the newest, the newest babes on the street are the ones that are very expensive. But the drugs that, the traditional drugs that we use for cancer care are available at Cancer Institute for free. But there is a cost associated with transport and then feeding, which cannot be made by the Institute. So I agree that it's costly. That's why we are trying to see that can we take the treatment to the community and make sure that the cost for transport are cut out. And that means that they can access treatment. And in so doing, in setting up these regional centers, we are thinking that the cost will be cut out drastically. And these regional centers will be also equipped with diagnostic services. It is not just cancer care is not delayed by only the treatment. Even the diagnosis, in the days that I started practicing, the sample used to come from Arua and take two weeks, take actually six months before the results get back for the patient to come. So by the time the patient came, they were stage four, but they had presented to the center early. So having that timely diagnosis and timely referral and timely access to care is very important for us. And that's why the strategy we've taken is to decentralize care. We hope that after we have decentralized to regional, we can decentralize and cascade up to even district hospitals because we cannot go to levels that are below that because it is a specialized care and most of the services we are giving come with side effects that would need somebody who is trained to look after them. So yes, that is what we are trying to do. I agree that there are few, few trained oncologists and that I speak about what Abraham says, that in previously people trained and after they are trained because they are not they are not they are not being paid the exact amount of money which the people where they went to train from are receiving they actually go out many of our people who are trained actually moved out so we decided to train in the country we are training from inside we are training from here such that they can we can retain more Definitely, we don't say we shall train all of them, but if they are trained on a government scholarship, definitely they will stay, and they are trained here, and hopefully they are not exposed to the exorbitant pay that uh, the, the <laughs> specialists That's out receive. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Elsa. So you've, I think you've also responded to Manjit, who was saying, in addition to oncologists and PC specialists, what about training oncology nurses? So I'm going to come to each of us, and I'll start with you, Dr. Usansa, in less than a minute, what would you like us to take home from this conversation today? Just very quickly, you have five minutes and there are five of you. I think what I want us to take from this, from this interaction is that cancer care is improving and there is still room to improve and the Cancer Institute is poised to, 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 to go the extra mile to make sure that there is accessible care in a timely manner to patients by all the interventions that we've discussed and I encourage us to live safely, I encourage us to screen, I encourage us not to wait till we feel the pain, that anything that we have should be, should be, should be reported and should be reported and insist on having it logically examined and explained away by a, a clinician. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I'll come next to Ms. Rose Chuanuka, uh, palliative care nurse specialist. Very much. Joseph, in mine, I would like to say that uh, this palliative care knowledge, every healthcare worker needs this knowledge so that patients can be helped wherever they are. Because patients are everywhere and we can't run away from palliative care with this increasing cancer and non communicable diseases. Thank you. Thank you very cool. much. Um, I'm going to come to Dr. Agasha Torin Birunji. Thank you very much. My take home and my message to, to the viewers is that the Palliative care is important and we really need to take this policy forward. This is really an appeal to all stakeholders involved. It's important for service provision, for training and for the support that we need to deliver this service. So it's really imperative that we move very fast to get our policy approved so that we can do better here. Yeah. Um, Dr. Chair, I'm going to skip you for now. You started this. I'd like you to end it. Mm -hmm. So I will come to Dr. Omoding. What would you like us to take home from this conversation? Thank you very much, Josephine. Uh, really, my take home, you know, um, message for the viewers is uh, prevention is better than cure. And uh, 
we grapple a lot with patients who come with cancer, more so in very late stage disease. My word to the audience is, and the viewers is prevent cancer. Learn the key things that you must do right in order not to get cancer. Go get vaccinated for the vaccinable cancers. Adhere to uh, regular medical checkups and screening so that if it, you developed it and it's caught early, you will be curable. And on top of that, we are in the COVID era and uh, adhere to the SOPs. Uh, make sure you wear your mask, you sanitize, you wash your hands, and you social distance. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Somadine. You've set the stage for Dr. Chobe to, to, to wrap up in less than a minute, Dr. Chobe. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Moding has done part of my work, and thank you so much, Abraham, for this. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for much, so much. This has been a very great interaction and a very good conversation. But, of course, to pick it up from here is that the interaction of the disruptions, uh, the disruptions that came with the COVID, uh, not only in cancer care, but also other illnesses, but not only other illnesses, but also the general population, the economy, uh, things that we had to bear to some extent, but we could avoid them if we really do what Abraham has said, SOPs. But more importantly, now that we have a remedy, that are the vaccines. We have several molecules that have come through. Initially, we are, were battling and we didn't have vaccines, but now they are coming through. There may be smaller operational ch challenges uh, in, the, in the access but those ones will, will get over them and i know in the next few months or two three months we'll have enough vaccines which we should take up so that we get all the things out and then return back to our normal lives Thank, thank you very you. much, Dr. Chove. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the panelists for their dedicated service and for discussing these very important issues today. We have heard about the efforts in fighting the pandemic. We've heard about the impact of the pandemic on the fight against cancer and the impact on palliative care. And we certainly hope that there will be useful lessons for the country to make progress on all three fronts. Thank you so much for staying with us. We now hand you over to the next session that's coming up. Thank you for staying with us. I'm Joanne Takawalia, the Pikau Goodwill Ambassador. I'm here to inform you that Uganda Cancer Institute, together with the Palliative Care Association of Uganda, in partnership with the Minister of Health, will host the third Uganda Conference on Cancer and Palliative Care on 23rd and 24th September 2021. The theme of the conference is Cancer and Palliative Care in COVID-19 and other challenging situations. This year's conference is a unique one and will be held virtually with some sessions broadcast live on UBC TV. We will have panel discussions, plenary sessions and workshops as well as presentations of abstract where scientists will share latest research on cancer and palliative care. This conference will bring together at least 400 policymakers researchers, health providers, patients, and the general public who will be watching online. I encourage you all to register for this important event. Registration for Ugandan delegates is 200,000 shillings. For more information, call 0392-080-713 or 0414-540-410. Email conference at uci.or.uj or conference at pcau.org.uj My home I smile when I think of you Uganda My home My home I dance when I look at you Uganda My home Oh my Uganda
MTN, we look forward to starting another exciting journey together to grow our home, Uganda. Welcome to May's Minute, and as you can hear, I really do only have about a minute. Now, I know that many of you are worried about what your child is learning during this pandemic. Now, my friend Abeo, he just called me and he said, May, this seems like an important time in my son's growth, but all he is doing is playing. Well, now, I'm going to tell you just what I told Abeo. For a young child, there is nothing more powerful than play. Now, play isn't just fun, it's how children's brains develop. They learn to communicate and to solve problems and to use their hands and body all through play. And play can be so many different things. Play is games and make-believe and it's building and it's running around outside and it's using your imagination. And you want to know what else I told Abeo? The most important thing you can do to support your son is to play with him. Play is beneficial to both of you. It can relieve stress and it can make your relationship stronger. And that relationship helps your child grow up to be happier, healthier, and more successful. Ready to play, Mom? Well, I sure am, Elmo. <laughs> well, that's my minute. And remember, play is powerful. You know, you could just buy a new smartphone from anywhere in Uganda. Dial star 175 star 94 hash to activate their 100% double data bonus offer on weekly or monthly bundles for three months. <laughs> Better yet, you automatically receive free 1GB valid for 30 days. <laughs> you are hooked already, aren't you? Enjoy a 100% double data bonus from Airtel. Buy a smartphone from anywhere in Uganda and insert an Airtel SIM card. Dial star 175 star 94 hash to activate a 100% data bonus offer on weekly or monthly bundles. Valid for three months. Dial star 175 hash and select your preferred bundle to activate a 100% data bonus offer on weekly or monthly bundles. Valid for three months. Airtel, the smartphone network. Getting Go TV was the best decision Gems has ever made. Finding a good place to watch football was never easy, but it was costly until Gems discovered something big. Now we can finally enjoy the benefits of homegrown advantage with a decoder and one month of Go TV value. For just 25,000 shillings, enjoy the world's biggest leagues and cap competitions. Go TV Uganda, love it. Akiri, Akiri, this is Akiri. She has a secret. Tell us, tell us. When the sun goes down, Akiri goes to sleep, and she enters a world where all the animals speak. Akiri, 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 Akiri. But there is something strange about this magic land. The animals speak English, which she doesn't understand. But if you help her out, we know we can. after our books, is it? Akili, can you show us how we look after our books and show them love? We don't leave books on the floor, we pick them up. We turn the pages carefully. And we don't draw or write on them. 
When we finish reading, we put our book back on the shelf, ready for another day. <sighs> Akili is falling asleep. I wonder what she'll dream of tonight. Wow! Look at this colorful place! Akili is back in La La Land. <laughs> What's wrong, Akili? Oh. Wow! You were sitting on a key. I wonder what it could be for. I know! Happy hip! Good idea! Little Maybe lion. your friends will know. Bush baby! Oh, but where are your friends? Prince, maybe your friends' footprints. Let's follow them and find out. <gasps> There's a river here. My friends? I think your friends might be on the other side, Akili. But look, there's a path of stones across the river. Yeah! The first stone is a circle. It's round like a wheel. Circle! Yes! And the next stone has three sides and three corners, like a samosa. It's a triangle! Triangle! Circle! Triangle! Circle! Triangle! Oh! The last stone is missing. Kids, which shape comes next? Hmm. Akili, what do you need to do? Yes, you need to think. Think, think, think. Circle or triangle? Triangle? All right, don't give up, Akili. Try again. Think, think, think. Hmm. Aha. Uh -huh. Circle. Well done, Akili. The next shape is circle. Yes, circle. Look. Uh -huh. More footprints. Let's follow them and find your friends. Wow! The footsteps have stopped at the bottom of this ladder. If you climb the ladder up into the tree, maybe you will find your friends. Red, red, blue. That's right. The steps on this ladder have different colors. They go red, red, blue. Red, red, blue. Red, red, blue. Red, red, blue. The last step on the ladder is missing. Akili, what do you need to do? Think. Think. Yes, you can use your head to think of a solution. Yay! Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> hmm. Blue or red? Kids, can you help Akili? Which color comes next? The 
words are right, Akili. Try again. Think, think, think. Think, think, think. Aha! Uh -huh. Red! Well done, Akili. The next color is red. Your friends are behind this door, Akili. Hmm, the door won't open. Don't give up. Try, try again. 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 The ants are right. Don't give up, Akili. Try again. Aha! Uh -huh. Think! Yes, Akili. You can think of a way to open it. Think, think, think! Let's all think really, really hard with Akili. Think, think, think! Aha! Uh -huh. Key! The key! Great idea! You can use the key you found to open the door. have thrown a surprise party for you, Akili, because they love you. Akili, but who? Think! Yes, you need to use your head and think to figure out who it is. Think, think, think! I know! Mother! That's right, your mother is calling you. It must be time to go home. You don't know how to get home. But that's okay, Akili. You can... Think! Yes! You can think of a way home. Yes! Think! Think, think, think! I know! Swoopaloo! Of course! The Swoopaloo can take you home. Swoopaloo! has arrived to take you home, Akili. Bye, friends! I love you all! Bye, bye, Akili! Bye, bye, Akili! We, we love you! We love you. <laughs> it's a beautiful day outside. Time to wake up, Akili. <sighs> Today, Akili will think, think, Think of something fun to do, like drawing. Then she will think, think, think of something nice to draw. Like her friends Happy Hippo, Little Lion and Bush Baby. And at night, when she goes to bed, she will dream of visiting them again in La La Land. <laughs> hey there, friends. What time is it? It's time for the alphabet. Hey, hey, hey. It's the letter of the day. But which letter shall we choose today? 
Letter Z, Z, Z. Letter Z, Z, Z. Show me the letter Z. Letter Z has made a flower grow. I wonder what else he will grow in the garden today. <coughs> oh dear, there are no flowers here. Aha! But Letter Z has some seeds to plant. Letter Z wants to plant a special Letter Z flower. Kids, can you help Letter Z to find the Letter Z seed? Hmm, which seed has the letter Z on? That one! Yes, you found the Letter Z seed. Letter Z is ready to plant his flower now. Look kids, the flower is growing. 